I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership here at City College, which is our School of Social Sciences. And I wanna welcome you to Environmental Justice and Just Sustainability in Harlem and Beyond. We are living through an extraordinary moment in the uh, centuries long struggle for racial and social justice in the United States and the much newer global movement for environmental justice and sustainability. An anti-racist movement, the largest in the nation's history and the power of which is growing in the wake of police killings. Um, we're in the midst of a new reckoning with the political power of black and brown people. And by many measures, we are at an inflection point, especially a generational inflection point in the movement for environmental justice and climate sustainability. Younger people across the globe and certainly here in the United States both see the connections between racism and environmental conditions and they have been moved to action, to community organizing, to participating in politics, to fighting for change in ways that on these issues is reaching unprecedented levels. All of this, and especially as it plays out right here in Harlem, is the subject of today's event. This discussion is part of a growing set of initiatives within the Colin Powell School to make more explicit and active the connections between our mission and the movements for social and racial justice in this country and environmental justice and sustainability. For all of its history, City College has been a radical and a political institution. It's been a place that for more than a century has been an experiment in how to make outstanding higher education available and affordable for all New Yorkers. We're a place that believes in shifting power in our society and in accomplishing that through intellectual honesty and intellectual progress by our faculty and with our students. And today's event is very much in that tradition um, we have two new student programs that connect directly to the subject of today's event, and I just want to mention them, Climate Policy Fellows and Racial Justice Fellows. Climate Policy Fellows is for students here at City College across all divisions who care about climate policy, sustainability, and environmental justice. And Racial Justice Fellows is for students, again, across all divisions here at City College who are committed to becoming leaders in anti-racist movements for change. Fellows in these programs receive paid internships, they receive intensive mentoring, special workshops and professional development. And these two programs are both currently recruiting for new students. So if you're a student here today, um, I hope you will be inspired by the discussion to think about applying for these programs so we can share a link um, about how you can do that in, in the chat as we get, get going here. Um, it is now my pleasure to, to turn it over to Professor Matt Riley, who is the organizer of today's event. Matt is an assistant professor of anthropology, gender studies, and international studies at City College and at the CUNY Graduate Center. His, his archaeological research explores issues of race, colonialism, slavery, and freedom in the Caribbean and West Africa. He's the author of Archaeology Below the Cliff, Race, Class, and Red Legs in Barbadian Sugar Society. Matt, thank you for putting this together and let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dean Rich. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to briefly introduce you all to today's event and our moderator. Before I do that, I first wanna thank Dean Rich for fully supporting this event, as well as thank Ricardo, Abby, and the entire Colin Powell School team for making this happen. In conversations with today's panelists as we plan this event, it was noted that environmental justice and sustainability are having a moment of sorts. There are terms and movements that are receiving increased attention on a global, national, and local scale. Yet despite growing awareness, an ambivalence remains. As conversations, policy, studies, and activism expand and reach new heights, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown a harsh light on the realities of intersecting forms of environmental racism, health disparities, and worsening patterns of disproportionately felt harm. This event was envisioned as a way to bring together specialists in the field of sustainability and environmental justice to highlight how social science approaches from fields like anthropology and on the ground activism and policy work from organizations like WE ACT can work together to combat, combat what are arguably some of the most urgent crises we face in Harlem, New York City, the United States, and indeed the world. Before I introduce our moderator who will then introduce our speakers, I'll quickly note that today's event is being recorded so we hope this can be a resources, resource that you view again in the future and share with your students, colleagues, classmates, classmates, and networks. During our moderated conversation, please feel free to engage by, using the questions and making by asking questions and making comments in the chat box. 
Members of our Colin Powell School team will call questions from the chat and present them to our panelists once we get to our Q&A period towards the end of our event. Today's moderator is Professor Sean Rickenbacker, a trained architect, urbanist, and urban data researcher who currently serves as an associate professor at the CCNY Spitzer School of Architecture and the director of the J. Max Bond Center for Urban Futures. A native New Yorker, Sean returned to the city to join us at CCNY after holding a number of prestigious positions at the Phyllis M. Taylor Institute for Social Innovation, Tulane University, Cornell University, and the University of Pennsylvania. Sean holds a Master's of Architecture with, with a certificate in American Urbanism from the University of Virginia and a Bachelor's of Architecture from Syracuse University. Big game coming up on Saturday. I met Sean through our work with CCNY's Canvas Engagement Network, where I came to admire his research confronting the complex intersection of spatial equity and the social and economic impacts of place-based policies, programs, and design through the lens of urban data, forensic, and re design research right here in our Harlem community, community notably along the 135th Street Corridor. Excuse me. I therefore welcome Sean to introduce our featured panelists and moderate what, prom what promises to be a thought-provoking and timely conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And, and thank you, Dean Rich uh, and Matthew, once again, for inviting me to participate uh, in today's event. It's really an, an, an honor and, and it certainly is an important subject matter uh, that uh, I'm glad to see we at City College are foregrounding uh, as we move ahead with these movements that Dean Rich has actually spoken about. I, th I think the, the, the moment and the timing uh, for these conversations is essential. And uh, I'm glad to see that City College is leading in this effort uh, with our students uh, right behind us and as they gain more knowledge uh, and expertise in these emerging fields. Um, today, I am joined by two giants in the field that I am truly honored to be um, moderating a conversation with. Um, both um, Peggy Shepard um, and um, Melissa Checker are both incredibly important contributors, uh, enormous contributors, I should say, uh, to the field of environmental justice and sustainability. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Melissa Checker, and then I will then um, introduce Peggy Shepard. So Melissa is the uh, Hagdorn Professor of Urban Studies at Queens College and Associate Professor of Anthropology and Environmental Psychology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Her research focuses on environmental justice activism in the U.S., urban sustainability, and environmental gentrification. She is the author of the book, The Sustainability Myth, Environmental Gentrification and the Politics of Justice, which came out in 2020, and The Polluted Promises, Environmental Racism and the Search for Justice in a Southern Town, published in 2005. She has also co-edited two contributed volumes and has published numerous articles uh, in academic journals, as well as in mainstream publications. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Ms. Peggy Shepard, uh, again, another giant in the industry, in the field, I should say, uh, of environmental and social justice. Peggy is the co-founder and executive director of WE Act for Environmental Justice and has a long-standing history of organizing and engaging Northern Harlem residents in community-based planning and campaigns to address environmental protection and environmental health policy locally and nationally. She has successfully combined grassroots engineering, uh, I'm sorry, grassroots, yes, engineering as well, but yeah. grassroots organizing, environmental advocacy, uh, environmental health and community-based participatory research to become a national leader in advancing environmental policy and perspective of environmental justice in urban communities. Um, now, I can continue here and, and, and I, I wanna make a, a few uh, points with regards to, to uh, Peggy's uh, involvement here, particularly in the context of Harlem. Um, and it's here in Harlem where a lot of this work has been grounded to ensure that the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment is extended to all. 
Uh, she has also served on the executive committee, committee for the National Black in uh, Environmental Justice Network and the Board of Advisors for the Columbia Nauman School of Public Health and the first female chair of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to the US Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. Her work has received broad recognition. Uh, one of my favorite authors, the Jane Jacobs Medal from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for Lifetime Achievement, the 10th Annual Heinz Award for the Environment and the Dean's Distinguished Service Award from the Columbia Mountain School of Public Health and honorary doctorates from Smith College and Lawrence University. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, guest as well as our uh, speakers uh, and begin our, our, our conversation. So uh, again, welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining us today. I think we have an amazing conversation in store for you all. So uh, maybe to begin with an opening question because I, I know uh, that there's quite a bit of interest uh, as I still see this as, as an emerging discipline, uh, more familiarity is uh, being acquired every year as more people uh, engage and learn about um, environmental justice uh, and sustainability issues. So perhaps uh, maybe Melissa, you can uh, begin by sharing with us how you came into your present research uh, and the desire to write your book, The Sustainability Myth. Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to Matt for inviting me and putting this together and to Ricardo and Sean for organizing and um, to Peggy for joining. It's really an honor to be here and to learn more about what you're doing at the Colin Powell School. And so thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna uh, show just a couple of visuals here. So um, I became interested in the issue of environmental justice through uh, working on, um, I, I was initially interested in issues of affordable housing and social justice, more urban issues. And I wasn't really, I didn't um, always think of the environment as being an urban issue, I have to admit. But when I was in uh, graduate school in my um, studying for my MA program, my MA degree, um, my one of my advisors told me about an issue going on in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And it was uh, the community had was protesting against the installation of an incinerator and what was uh, interesting or unique, I guess, about that situation was it was um, a group of uh, uh, Latinx activists had come together with uh, Hasidic activists and some African American community members, um, and they had all kind of come together and started working to protest this incinerator. And it, historically, um, uh, those groups had been sort of at odds with each other. They had. Um, been a little bit embattled over resources, access to affordable housing and schools, but they had come together um, to fight against the incinerator because they had realized that their neighborhood was already highly polluted. And they had um, the Williamsburg Bridge and the BQE going through. So they had a lot of uh, traffic from trucks and cars. Um, they had other polluting facilities in the area. It's a formerly heavily industrialized area. So, and they had really this rubric of environmental justice, this idea that we all breathe the same air had brought them together and had enabled them to overcome their differences and fight against this incinerator. This was back in the 1990s. Um, and it really inspired me to think about the environment as yet another urban resource to which um, low income neighborhoods and communities of color lacked access. And I realized that the environment was a way to sort of talk about all of those resources that were unevenly distributed across the city. So this is just some statistics that kind of give you, um, you know, a, an idea of the um, degree to which um, exposure to pollution is unevenly distributed, especially if you think about it in terms of how much people actually contribute to pollution. So we know that affluence is highly related to uh, generating waste um, and carbon emissions. And so you can see that um, there are many levels in which um, things are unfair and inequitable. So for my dissertation research, I decided to go to the US South and 
oops, and study um, a very small community of former sharecroppers uh, in Augusta, Georgia. And they had, um, under Jim Crow laws, they had been able to buy, purchase property in this little, very swampy parcel um, area. And um, it happened to be surrounded by a couple of uh, factories at the time, which seemed like a good thing. This would have been back in the 40s and 50s because people could find jobs and they could own their own homes. Uh, but pretty quickly as a neighborhood, as more people came and moved into the neighborhood, the um, industrial sites around it also multiplied. And pretty soon they uh, were surrounded by seven polluting facilities. They called themselves the hole in a toxic donut. And in um, 1990, they, in the late 1990s, they figured out that one of those um, facilities had been leaking toxic chemicals. Um, in fact, it turned out that there were several of the facilities that had been leaking toxic chemicals. And so these people had been very engaged in the civil rights movement. And they, um, when they found out they had been polluted and that, and they couldn't, you know, they weren't offered any compensation for their health, um, and they also realized that they could connect their health problems to the contaminants. They uh, sort of extended their civil rights activism to become a, a, a environmental justice, um, a environmental justice battle. And so I, I went down there and lived with them for about 14 months and uh, worked with them at, um, and uh, wrote a book about uh, their struggles and the ways in which they were thinking about um, environmental justice and the environment. And then in 2007, I moved back to New York City. And um, one thing that I, I learned about environmental justice activists is that even though these people were in this tiny little neighborhood in Augusta, Georgia, um, this was a junkyard that was on the outskirts of that neighborhood. And that was one of the polluting factories. Um, they were very well networked nationally with the growing environmental justice movement. And so I came to New York and um, two of the activists I worked with there had come to visit me in New York and they um, took me up to Harlem and introduced me to Peggy Shepard and the legendary Cecil Corbin Mark over at WE ACT. And um, so that's how I you know, got introduced to some environmental justice folks in New York City. And um, at that point in 2007, when I'd moved to, back to New York, uh, Mayor uh, Michael Bloomberg had just released Plan YC 2030, which was his big plan for sustainability. And what I also knew from my research with EJ activists was that they had been talking about sustainability for a long time. And it was really a word that um, carried a lot of meaning on us um, a way to kind of achieve social sustainability, economic sustainability, political and ecological. So there were a lot of things wrapped into that term. And um, it really was a term that, that was, um, you know, that matched the vision for environmental justice. So what I wanted to see was how that kind of played out. And I thought initially, you know, that um, perhaps this would be a real boost for sustain for the cause of environmental justice to have all this attention to sustainability and this big uh, sweeping sustainability plan. And I wanted to really see if, if um, how, how that sustainability plan was going to intersect with the uh, goals of environmental justice activists. So what I found out was that while there were some benefits to Bloomberg's plan and some, some good things that were coming out of it, it also had uh, explicitly tied certain sustainability initiatives to real estate development. And so um, some of those initiatives, and I'll probably talk about more of them as we go on, were, was that um, there were new green spaces being created. And um, in a lot of ways, uh, those were, there were new funding mechanisms so that a lot of those green spaces could be funded or eventually managed by developers, meaning that they were sort of counting on higher property values. Um, and so they were, they're being installed along with these plans for um, gentrifying an area. Now that wasn't in all cases. And I, I can talk about details of that later. And there were some cases like in Harlem where um, we act actually was very involved in the um, building of the green site of the Harlem Pier, West Harlem Piers Park and managed to keep private monies out of it. And so that it really 
made, remained a public resource. But in other cases, like in Williamsburg, Greenpoint, um, Brooklyn Bridge Park, there was a lot of private money in these green spaces. So they were ending up to be not necessarily um, for all members of, of the communities. Um, and uh, I also looked at the cleanup of brownfield sites, which is what is mapped on this project. And again, I can go into more detail later. Um, and we found that um, they were also clustered in gentrifying neighborhoods, uh, brownfield projects, and this sort of shows you how they're um, clustered in a lot in central Brooklyn and on the, um, around the High Line in Manhattan. Um, and then I also looked at the, um, uh, the cleaning and greening of, for, of manufacturing centers. So small scale manufacturing, things like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the uh, Army Terminal and um, the Industry City and Sunset Park and look at, uh, look at sort of how those have become also mechanisms um, or tied to gentrification, I should say. So it seemed like there was, um, it was possible to put environmental justice concerns into the sustainability agenda, but it, it was a very hard and long fight in order to do so. Um, so I, I think with that, I'll stop to talk. Great, Peggy. Um, so Melissa, thank you so much. Um, and Peggy, I guess as a similar question for you because it's, it's really fascinating that you all have been so involved and, and can actually share uh, the kind of history and the evolution of the movement. So you have witnessed this evolution firsthand, uh, sort of on the front line, if you will. So can you outline how you became involved uh, and what in particular called you to, uh, to action with We Act? With the, uh, we Act. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so um... I have a longer story, but I'll make it a little shorter to say that uh, I had uh, had a, about a 10 year career in magazines and, and newspapers as a journalist and uh, used my skills to work in political campaigns, got involved in the first Jesse Jackson campaign for president, where I uh, became the public relations director for the first campaign and began to promote uh, young people who were running as delegates to the convention all over New York City. And so I really had an opportunity to understand the level of advocacy versus the level of benefits that particular communities had. So when uh, the Jackson campaign and then the Mondale Ferraro campaign um, were over and they did not win, um, I was asked by Bill Lynch, who was the campaign manager extraordinaire, uh, if I was interested in running for office and being out front or being behind the scenes producing other people. And so he ran my campaign for Democratic District Leader in West Harlem. Um, I was paired with Chuck Sutton, who was the nephew of Percy Sutton, uh, one of the you know, big powerhouses, political powerhouses in Harlem. He had also been borough president. And so we were elected and some of our volunteers said, well, are you going to get people um, hired at the North River sewage treatment plant that had just been constructed to clean up the Hudson River? Um, before the North River pollution, uh, water pollution control plant was, was constructed, if you flushed the toilet on the west side of Manhattan, it all went into the Hudson River. So there was a federal consent decree with the city that they had to build this plant. So the plant um, was constructed, uh, began hiring in about 1986. And um, I didn't know anything about a sewage treatment plant. People said they wanted jobs. Chuck and I went on radio um, and we got people jobs. We got people 30 jobs there. A few months later, the plant began operating. It was spewing odors and emissions, making people sick. Uh, the plant is located between 138th Street and 145th Street in the Hudson River. So everybody along Riverside Drive, and this plant is one of 14 in New York City, but it, it's the closest to people's homes of any plant here. So immediately people began coming to me saying, what are we gonna do? You've got to educate the community. Um, how are we gonna push back? 
you know, my, my grandchildren who have asthma are experiencing more attacks. Um, I can't open my windows. I can't use my, my little balcony. Um, and so what are we gonna do? So we started a eight year campaign. Um, mayor Koch was, was mayor at that time. Um, he did not interact with people of color, uh, namely the elected officials uptown. He did not believe there was any problem. And so Chuck and I began to hold monthly meetings of a hundred people coming out monthly for literally eight years. Um, and then I was able to get, um, you know, we, we took a long time for us to figure out how the plan actually operated. So I was calling engineers and people all over the city. It seems like every engineer in New York City had had some contract at the plant. Um, but what really changed was when David Dinkins uh, became borough president. He was elected borough president at the same time I was elected district leader. And he obviously had lived uptown. He lived at uh, like 157th and Riverside. So he was clear about the plant. And um, so he gave us money to hire Barry Commoner, who was uh, a major environmentalist at Queens College. He started uh, the Center for Biology of Natural Systems, which is still operating uh, at Queens College, I think under a different name. And so Barry Commoner did a report on the operations of the plant. So it really gave us the first opportunity to understand how the plan operated, what was necessary for it to operate well, because it couldn't be shut down. Um, so our goal was to not only uh, have it fixed, but our second goal was to make sure that environmental justice was on the city agenda. And so um, a few years later, we were able to get in touch with the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, and uh, Eric Goldstein, who heads their New York City program, helped us file a lawsuit against the city. And by that time, David Dinkins was now mayor. And uh, David Dinkins grew up in Trenton, New Jersey with my father. Um, so I, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. And so uh, I ended up suing my good friend, David Dinkins, only because we knew that we needed a mandate, that it couldn't be just dependent on whether, on the good graces of David Dinkins sure. him yeah, being in office. Sure. And so our lawsuit was settled on the last day of his administration in 1994, uh, 1993, I'm sorry, uh, for $1.1 million environmental benefits fund for West Harlem. And we were able to get a grant from that fund to hire our first staff. And our first staff member was Cecil Corbin Mark, um, who was mentioned by Melissa. Um, who was with us for 26 years and just passed away, um, just an untimely death uh, last October. Um, but Cecil grew up on Convent Avenue, three blocks from the City College, um, and uh, was very committed to the community. I live across the street from City College. Um, so, fantastic. so again, that's really how I, I got involved by community residents saying there's a problem understanding how to organize um, against that problem, uh, deciding to, to build We Act for Environmental Justice or, or West Harlem Environmental Action, we were called at that time, because we understood that we needed to institutionalize advocacy in this community. You know, communities of color are, have a lot of social service groups, but we don't have a lot of groups that do civic engagement, right. get people involved with, policy with going to the city council, with talking to their elected officials. Mm -hmm. So once we saw that issue, we began to see others. Uh, your eyes really get opened, you're woke. And um, we saw all of the depots um, that out of the eight depots in Manhattan, seven were uptown. So we actually housed over one third of the largest diesel bus fleet in the country. And I can talk a little later about why sure. that's so important. Sure. Sure. This, this is truly fascinating. I mean, both of you have um, revealed something about your work that I think is uh, a little known skill that is becoming incredibly valuable. And that is the kind of act of forensics research, it's sort of uh, following the trail, if you will, 
um, and, and constructing an argument around evidence. And so on, on the one hand, I, I applaud you both for the work that you've done, uh, but also just wanted to, to point out that it's significant in that ability uh, to be able to reconstruct uh, these events that then uh, provide us a kind of history and a context to kind of understand what's at stake. Um, and so uh, maybe just another a note here. I mean, Peggy, that, that story about uh, you and David Dinkins, I think this is the first time I've ever heard of a sort of friendly lawsuit, uh, but, but a necessary one. And I think that that's absolutely uh, fascinating in and of itself. Uh, another point, that I would want to bring up is, is you point out, particularly with respect to Harlem, that it had, um, I think you said, uh, the largest diesel fleet in the nation was being housed in, in the community of Harlem. And then recently, because Riverbank is, is one of my uh, sort of research arenas as well, and I've discovered that Riverbank services 38% of the island of Manhattan. So over the years, and that has increased from when it first came online. So there, the, the, the fact that there are these uh, proportional disparities in terms of which communities have to service us as we try to manage our environment and manage our human lives is, is really important. And that's funny enough, that information is not generally publicly advertised, right? So one has to kind of do the research to get this information and then, then to share it with, uh, with the general public so they can be aware. Right, so that, that awareness is interesting. This leads me to a second question, uh, perhaps for, for both of you. Now, we understand at this point that the environment uh, by its very nature is, is very complex. Um, if you combine that with the man-made infrastructures that we're referring to, Melissa showed some in the slides, we're speaking about Riverbank, uh, uh, the truck depots that exist throughout the city, um, and all of these things help to manage our environment, whether it be water, waste, uh, production of industry and chemicals. Um, that makes this thing unruly, almost you know, even more difficult for one to kind of easily comprehend. So how do we disseminate what environmental justice really is um, and why it's important um, and what's required to perhaps achieve it? So it's a sort of a three-part question. You could take any part. Well, the problem with the dissemination has been that out of the 23 uh, and a half billion dollars uh, in philanthropy that goes to environment, uh, less than 1% goes to environmental justice communities. So most environmental justice organizations have very few staff, certainly don't have a communications director, and have not been able over the last 30 some years that we have been uh, an acknowledged movement have not had the capacity to do that because of media bias, um, feeling that, you know, those community groups, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, um, in, in fact, you know, I mentioned that we, our lawyer was in our DC, uh, the New York Times would only call Eric Goldstein downtown to ask about North River and finally, he had to say, I will not give you another interview until you talk to WIAC. So there is a bias in the media. And that's just it recently, since George Floyd's murder changed with the media calling every day. Um, it's also changed because the Biden administration had said they're going to center environmental justice and they have moved to a point um, really progressive and diverse people to the um, agencies that, that focus on climate and environment. So we've really redefined environment as where we live, work, play, and go to school. So we look at environment very different than the larger green groups and the conservation movement. And so we're, we know that the environment takes place with air quality on 125th Street or 145th Street or 135th Street. And so that's where our focus is. And we also understand that environmental exposures contribute to the glaring health disparities that are experienced by people of color. We know that disease is an in interaction between our biology, between age and the environment. And that's not something that people really understand that 
disease is a is caused by an interaction also with the environment. And so we also know that that disparate exposure has led to more COVID deaths. Uh, the Harvard study showed that, um, again, uh, the, the groups that lived in the most polluted communities had the highest death rates from COVID. So again, um, I think we're just now getting um, a broader picture of the environment. I think when we have poster children for the environment, like the Flint water crisis, somehow it emerges into the public consciousness, uh, but then it goes away. Yeah. And so we really have to do the kind of public education and the environmental literacy so that people really understand the impact of these exposures uh, on our public health. Yeah. Well, well, Melissa, I, I'd like to offer you the same question because I know, you know your publications are um, you know, extraordinarily useful and helpful for people to understand the, the context a bit. Maybe you can um, you know, expound a bit on this uh, question on what's needed to achieve uh, the kind of gains that, that Peggy is talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, historically, the environment has, well, historically, the environmental mainstream environmental movement has um, been based on this idea that the environment is neutral. You know, it's one of these sort of resources or um, issues that is seen as, you know, how could it be have any kind of racial implications or, you know, uh, because it seemed to be something that's just out there. Uh, and so that decision making around the environment is is thought to be neutral and activism, environmental activism, or, you know, is seen to sort of be for the common good. And what we know is that historically, um, the environmental movement emerged as a white middle class and also elitist movement and, and the um, kind of ideals that it was founded on like conservation and preservation, while they certainly are of importance to everybody they were also kind of um, the way that it was framed in, in the US, especially uh, where we kind of like set nature aside in these national parks and these areas yeah, to which sure. only wealthy people really had access. Um, mm -hmm. And so we kind of, so there was this kind of separation between what were civil considered uh, racial justice struggles and environmental struggles. And so, um, and that divide that kind of, um, had was carried through, let's say it's carried through up until the environmental justice movement, which really is working to bring those two things together. But I think people sort of still see, and I think it's it, one thing to think of too, is when you think of something as the environment as being neutral, you kind of think, well, how could that be again? How could that have racial implications? It serves some people to think of it as neutral, right? It serves those people that are not bearing the brunt of our toxic waste. Um, and so it's, you know, um, if you have the privilege to live in an area with a clean and healthy environment where you don't have to worry about these facilities around you polluting you, then you can think of the environment as neutral. You have that sort of luxury sure. of doing that. Mm -hmm. But hopefully now that, you know, we're having more conversations about institutional racism and structural racism, um, people are realizing that that none of these things are neutral and, and that there is sort of um, there's a history behind all of them and, and discrimination, you know, discriminatory effects, not to mention intent behind all of them as well. Yeah, no, I think you've already touched on what was going to be my third question, you know, this, this idea of what are some of the impacts of environmental justice. And, and I think, you know, it's when you mentioned, um, and I, I thought of as you were speaking that, you know, this, the simple question of, of, do you know where you're waste and refuse goes after you discard it. I mean, there's, uh, you know, first world problems, as they would say. Uh, but I think, you know, we're now beginning to see that that kind of engagement and understanding of the environment is, is not, it's not a neutral act putting your trash, trash out. Uh, it's not such a neutral act, as Peggy mentioned earlier, flushing your toilet. Uh, there are implications involved. And I think globally as we begin to understand these uh, relationships, right? The interconnectedness of our daily activities, uh, our patterns of behavior, 
we then begin to uh, dismantle this idea that the environmental concern has been cornered by one group of people. But I think we can then disseminate how we're all impacted. Uh, and, and as you've already both mentioned, disproportionately impacted. Um, you know, the design of cities and highways and where they go, uh, zoning of industrial areas, uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, uh, and I believe uh, Newark, New Jersey, I know Peggy's relationship to Trenton, those places have uh, long histories regarding the kind of uh, industrial waste damage that has been um, uh, saddled uh, with those um, communities that were left behind when those industries left. And so it's, it's really kind of, um, I won't say unintended consequences, but you know, the question I, I guess I'm setting you up for, are these unintended consequences or did government industry and, and planners, et cetera, know or have an idea that you know, the environment would, could and would suffer? And, and did we look away for the benefit of industry and, and commerce? Well, you know, th th there's such a long history of, of how we got here. You know, there was a GI, GI Bill where, you know, um, you know, folks came back, people of color came back from, from the army, but they couldn't um, access, you know, a mortgage uh, the way other folks could. Um, we know that the communities today that have been historically redlined are now the communities that we can show um, are the victims of extreme heat. You know, how does that happen? Was that intentional? That probably was not intentional, but we have seen um, redlining from banks, lack of investment in the community in which you're sitting uh, at City College. Um, and we still know that uh, a black person and a white person trying to get a mortgage with the same credit background that the black person will still have a harder time getting that mortgage. And so there are systemic issues that have led us to where we are. Um, we also know that certain land was not as valued. And so as a result, more facilities are going to focus and locate there. Mm -hmm. But we also know, for instance, um, when we filed a lawsuit against the Metropolitan Transit Authority, for building another depot on 133rd Street um, between Broadway and 12th across the street from a large housing project as well as a school, um, they are exempted from environmental review if they have a transportation facility. <laughs> so we said, well, yeah, you know, the you used to use this for a trolley barn, but now there's a whole community that's grown up around you since then. And you should be able to do an environmental impact statement. Absolutely. Well, the court said they didn't have to. Yeah. Um, but they wanted to put housing on top of the depot. Um, and we were able to stop that because that was not a transportation use. Yeah. So there, um, there are a variety of permitting situations. Um, for instance, if you look at Louisiana, yeah. where the state gets so much of its tax revenue from the petrochemical facilities, yeah. they are not trying to um, enforce the laws with, with those kinds of companies. Yeah. So Can't. yes, there's yeah. intention, there's big money, there's big lobbyists that allow, um, you know, that, that pay our elected officials or contribute to elected officials who give a blind eye to more and more facilities uh, disproportionately impacting one community. Yeah which is why activism is so important. Melissa, I, I see you sort of nodding and yeah. <laughs> I wanna give you an nodding. opportunity to maybe tackle that. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to sort of tease these things out in terms of um, um, how intentional, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's, these are sort of unintentional things, but also, you know, it's been very difficult to prove intent, in fact, early on in the environmental justice movement when communities brought lawsuits against uh, governments or companies for you know, discriminatory uh, citing, um, citing you know, uh, they were sort of 
mandated to prove intent, right? If they, if they were sort of file, um, filing their lawsuit under uh, Civil Rights Act. And, and, you know, that's almost impossible. We can't get into the minds of planners or even um, heads of corporations always to say that it's discriminatory, but I, but you know, but it's what's important to note is that it's a long and intricate history that combines very intentional discrimination with maybe some just institutional discrimination, which is often as much about advantage, advantaging certain groups as it is about disadvantaging other groups, um, and that these things kind of intertwine and accumulate over time, so it becomes hard to tease it out. And, and again, it's, I think it's a combination of all of them. I mean, and it goes all the way back to, um, you know, um, the whole history of our country. And yeah, the, yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's, this could be a entirely separate uh, session on its own. The question of the intended versus unintended consequences, but uh, it makes me think about a, a recently passed law um, through the former administration uh, called Opportunity Zones. And, um, you know, speaking of tracking histories, um, you know, and I think, Melissa, what you point out, which I would call a kind of institutionalized opportunity, um, you know, perpetuates the, the problem as opposed to uh, attempt to redirect the focus of some things that we've done in the past for new models. Maybe, um, and maybe for our audience, you know, I'll give a kind of brief intro to Opportunity Zones. The former Trump administration passed a law uh, that made it uh, incredibly at attractive in terms of um, tax exposure to uh, develop uh, real estate holdings, essentially, uh, in disproportionately areas of black and brown people throughout the country. Uh, so, and, and I think the terminology was actually blighted communities. Um, and if we look at the history, there was also, you know, one could map former industrial areas, um, you know, the, the toxic cleanup that might be necessary in some of these environments, spanning from Atlanta to the, the, the Rust Belt uh, to here in the Northeast. Um, I wonder if any, uh, if either of you have any thoughts on, on that, this idea of the institutionalized opportunity um, and how do we combat or deal with that? Is it just through uh, revealing that it exists or does it mean that we need to then pursue other measures uh, at the perhaps state, local and federal levels? You know, as Peggy has experience with lawsuits uh, and or this, uh, discovery of, of, uh, of evidence and information that helps uh, reveal these uh, transgressions, if you will. Yeah, you know, um, you know, systemic issues from the federal government created the segregated housing that has, has allowed industry to locate in communities of color because those communities were already segregated. But uh, we have an opportunity zone in East Harlem. Through that opportunity zone, nobody can find out who, who's gotten the credits. No one can find out what the proposal is. There is no um, mandate to consult with the community or have a needs assessment. You can literally start a hot dog stand and get credits because it's also about job creation. So we, we had a meeting um, recently with Nancy Pelosi and other uh, folks in Congress and have spelled this out, how the opportunity zones also don't um, mandate any concern about um, th the fact that you might be in a, um, in a, uh, uh, a climate zone uh, where a sea level rise uh, area like- mm -hmm. uh, Like a floodplain or something. Yes in a floodplain, I'm sorry, uh, like East Harlem is in. So we really have to think about all in government policies and Biden is talking about that. How do we insert environmental justice into all considerations? How do we insert climate into thinking about all urban planning as well? Um, you know, the extreme heat issues um, are gonna be because of the built environment, the lack of trees, I know I heard something about you're focused on 135th Street. There are no trees right, on right. 135th Street. Yeah, heat and island I, effect. 
I kept telling the Biden, uh, the uh, Bloomberg administration, I was on the sustainability advisory board. Not one new tree has been planted on 135th Street. Yeah. So opportunity zones are a giveaway to developers. And Biden is saying 40% of benefits are going to go to frontline communities. And we've got to have that to happen. Yeah, we'll have to see. I'll have to see. We'll have Melissa, to see. The, the, so the this institutionalized and systemic patterning of opportunities it made me think about your term, um, environmental gentrification. I, you know, I wonder if you could maybe expand on that term and, and are the two related? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think I think they are. I mean, I think, um, you know, um, what I found in my research is that, and again, you know, um, Peggy pointed this out the other day, and, and you know, certainly is very true that gentrification is an uneven process, and it, it doesn't happen uniformly across the city at all. And a lot of things are, you know, um, influence the degree to which a neighborhood gentrifies. Some neighborhoods take off and completely transform, like Williamsburg, which hasn't even entirely transformed, but most of it, um, or Dumbo, you know, um, but other neighborhoods are, the pace is much slower and unfolds over time. And there's also community intervention into the process, which changes how it, it turns out. But if you look kind of when I was looking um, at different examples across the city and looking at the city as a whole, I was seeing that, um, again, especially starting with the Bloomberg administration, um, there were a lot of incentives going to developers to um, create more environmental benefits um, in the name of sustainability. And so um, that could have been like a waterfront Espelande or a waterfront park or a regular park, or um, again, cleaning up of some polluted uh, uh, properties. Um, and a lot of that became these sort of incentivized uh, development, but, but really luxury development. So again, not, not saying that all development is bad, but these were, um, this was really, so Bloomberg came in before he kind of was, became the green mayor he wanted to, he came in after 9-11 um, to bring the city out of the 9-11 recession. And his goal was to make New York a luxury city, a place that would attract tourists and uh, corp, you know, corporate headquarters and tech businesses. And he wanted to make New York into this high-end sort of jewel. Um, and so he combined his kind of sustainability agenda with that luxury city agenda. And so uh, a lot of of that, um, again, he, he did a lot of incentivizing for high-end development, which went along with these green amenities. And so what the, you know, the kind of unfortunate consequence of that is that for some neighborhoods who were advocating for environmental justice and for environmental improvements for many years would get some of those improvements only to find themselves eventually priced out of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was that in some cases, people were once, you know, if the city uh, planning department would come in and say, okay, we might want to put this park here. People in the neighborhoods were like, no, we don't want that park. Yeah, yeah. Because they were afraid that it was going to, come. it was a sign of gentrification yeah. and that put them in an um, impossible position because yeah. uh, it shouldn't have to be that choice. Right. Well, that that's, you know, and I know Peggy, you've dealt with this firsthand. The, the impossible position. On the one hand, the new vision that I think that we're talking about, uh, unlike the luxury city, is an environmentally just city, right? which includes trees and parks, but not at the expense, nor at the kind of crafted opportunity for development uh, that may be unwanted. So luxury housing, let's say, versus affordable housing. Um, so it seems that we're, we're stuck at a, a sort of impasse, if you will, that the, the public imagination has to be transformed a bit around what an a environmental, environmentally just city actually looks like, right? What, is, what are the components to kind of make it uh, both accessible and desirable without the fear? And, and I, won't, I won't say 
the removal of all fear, because I guess we mentioned gentrification is very complex and thorny, uh, but at least a reduced fear that what is good for you does not bring along again the unintended consequences of displacement. Mm -hmm. so, so what is crafting a new public imagination around the environment look like? I mean, we have students here, I, I imagine, who are the next wave and generation to carry the torch, but, uh, the, but we're still here and have some work to do ourselves. Right? Well, one way to start would be to come up with another word for environment. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I think you're onto something. People have, have a concept of what that is, and that concept is not that it impacts them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we really have to relate uh, environmental exposures, environmental issues to the lived experience of regular people. You know, in this community, um, we have about 800 members. Most of them are low income. Over 20% live in public housing. The brownstoners that are across the street from City College are not the people who come out on these issues. It is the people who are more affected and who have mold in their apartments, where the elevators are out um, and, and they have all of these indoor air issues as well as the, uh, the outdoor environments. And we've really got to, and you know, I talk a lot to the, the big green groups who are all now trying to diversify and develop strategic plans around diversity, but we're not going to have strong national climate legislation without the general public understanding what that means for them, the impact on them and why they should care. And I think people are now beginning to understand that they have got to relate these issues to the everyday lived experience. Otherwise the public imagination will be uh, the people in Flint um, right. still have to use bottled water, but not understanding that they might have an issue with their school's uh, uh, drinking water fountain where there's lead in, in the water fountains. They're not understanding that yes, it can hit right here at home. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and some of that is about environmental literacy and yeah. understanding um, what, you know, for instance, you know, we've been working with the um, Columbia Children's Environmental Health Center and they've been able to study um, mothers in the South Bronx and Harlem and understand the impact that diesel has uh, on the mother, on the growing uh, fetus, on the resulting child's development. Yeah. So we're now beginning to understand those impacts of, of uh, chemicals and mm -hmm. a whole variety of allergens on the impact of children's development and then how it has an intergenerational impact uh, that is genetic as well. Yeah, yeah. So the literacy, and then the literacy has to impact the public policy. If we yeah. don't have regular people who understand the issue, they can't tell their elected official. And the elected official, some of them are tired, especially if they're in Harlem, of seeing downtown um, white advocates. They want to know, well, if this is important, why isn't the person uh, who I live next door to coming sure. to me? About sure, this issue. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. The 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 issues um, are indeed, I think, um, not well distributed in terms of representation, right? And so, and in part because of the the literacy and and it is the environment, right? I mean, you know, we all breathe, but we don't know what we're breathing, right? And I know Melissa, you spoke about. You know, one of the, the areas that I've researched quite a, for quite a while is air quality and the fact that, you know, the, the airborne particles, uh, particulate matter, 2.5, and, and for our audience, you know, you might want to look this up. Um, but, you know, air, New York's air quality has, has greatly improved. Um, and I, I should say Manhattan's air quality because I, I, I am a product of the Bronx and the, the Cross Bronx Expressway is still there. Those trucks still run through. And the problem is it still exists as has been reported by the Harvard study. Um, but Melissa, maybe you could speak about um, what to some um, people, they actually believe that uh, 
it is like a myth, right? That, well, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist, right? Um, which is just the opposite. Once you know the science and understand the data, it, it points you to a very different story. Um, so maybe in regards to your book's title, uh, The Sustainability Myth, how do we overcome it? Well, I mean, I, um, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a couple things. I think one is that there are no quick and easy answers to our you know, issues of uh, climate change mitigation or air pollution mitigation. And um, to think that you know, erecting a big glassy building and calling it green is gonna solve our problem is yeah. not the right way to think Absolutely. about it. And, Absolutely. and to think that you know, waterfront development, um, no matter how you know, resilient it's meant to be is not gonna solve our problems. And so we have to really, look beyond these quick solutions, I think, and, and think very carefully um, about how, what kind of city we're, we're, is being created. Uh, very well said. For us. Um, yeah. And I also think, I, I, you know, one of the people I worked with in Augusta used to say, uh, pollution doesn't stop at the train tracks. And he meant because, you know, they were always living on the other side of the tracks. It doesn't stop at the train tracks. It's going to sneak up and bite you too. Mm -hmm. And people have to realize that this isn't just a problem for, communities of color or poor communities, if, if it's there, it's gonna affect all of us eventually. I mean, that shouldn't necessarily have to be the motivator, right. but if, yeah. it, if that's what it takes, you know, it's, it's gonna affect all of us. Yeah. And, um, and if we don't resolve the problems up, you know, in the South Bronx and Harlem, the whole city suffers. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, both of your comments make me realize just how important it is that we begin to think more systemically Right, that the, the environment is part of the human ecology that we've created around cities. Uh, and we've ignored it perhaps for far too long. You know, the, the, what is the number of trees per person we should have? That, maybe that should be policy. And for those cities that are behind, we need to plant and be very proactive from the community level right up to the administrative level uh, to achieve these new goals. But I think it's that radical systemic thinking that uh, we're all gonna have to embark upon and much like Peggy, your work and Melissa, your research, which I would say is radical in the most fundamental and wonderful ways uh, in terms of how you make progress. Um, so with that, um, maybe I can open it up for some questions from the audience. I think we have just about uh, eight minutes left. Um, so I'm, I'm Scanning for my um, for my colleague here, Matthew, to see if he's actually directed me to some uh, some questions. Apparently, there's been quite quite a few here. Yeah, there's a lively conversation <laughs> going on. In the there, there there is, which is fantastic, which is fantastic. But uh, I see one here. I'm going to take a question from Gabrielle Reyes, uh, whose question is um, it's a two part question. Um, what are the future of fossil fuel companies? And the second part of that question, um, which is part of a comment, I don't believe there is uh, a future for them in an environmentally just society, but they do have a stranglehold on most federal lawmakers uh, and local and state lawmakers. How do we tie this issue to campaign finance? Or can we? Well, first of all, we need campaign finance. For, for all the issues. And, and we don't have it because the Congress has to, to vote on it and the Republicans um, just are not going to do that. So we're still trying though. Um, I would say that even without public policy, uh, well, no, let me start again. Our public policy is now saying, especially in a city like New York, that we need to uh, be, uh, at 100% renewables by 2050. And I think 80% by 2035. I yeah, hope yeah. those states are right. Um, which means that we will be purchasing less uh, oil. Um, we're, we're finding that the utility companies are already focusing on electrification. They're already focusing on, uh, on how to you know, trans, transform. Right. Uh, their operations. 
So that is happening sort of naturally. Um, obviously, um, there are going to be some hardcore companies, but they're all secretly um, beginning to strategize on how they're transforming because there is a new reality. Yeah. It may not be as fast as we like, but most uh, policies are talking about 2050 being totally off of fossil fuel. It's, it's coming. It's coming. It's I mean, coming. J just today, um, there was an announcement that the, um, the, the resources used for large scale batteries, like the Tesla batteries, et cetera, uh, has come down exponentially in price, making it therefore more affordable. And they expect this impact to have, um, they expect this to have great impact across the, the, the battery and renewable energy uh, fields, which you know, previously up until today had been tagged as uh, simply not cost effective. Um, and so with the reduction in, in pricing, which it will continue to go down, I believe, I think we'll start to see uh, an escalation or acceleration towards the renewable um, kind of mandates that are, that are being set forth. Um, so I think we have time for one more question that I'm, I'm scanning for, and I don't know if I'll find it again, but I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase. Um, I think it was, it was more specific to the uh, Harlem community, in fact. Let me see if I can drum this up. Well, so we now know that, um, you know, the, the environment in its totality, right? the, the, the residents, the buildings, the roads, the subway, the transportation, all of this uh, amounts to what we described earlier as a very complex environmental system. Um, do we have the priorities of this system in the right place? I know that the city and, and just about every um, administration that takes office puts an enormous focus on housing uh, and particularly affordable housing as it's still a national crisis and may become more of a crisis as we're seeing evictions due to COVID. Um, how does the um, environment that is man-made, the built, and the infrastructure to support that. What is the role and responsibility of leadership in making sure, and Melissa, you touched on this already, it's not simply uh, saying that a building is LEED certified and so-called green, uh, but I think it really takes a, a new level of thinking and perhaps design and goals to achieve you know, reduced energy demands on just about every household across the board, uh, reduced uh, amounts of waste uh, that comes from those households. How do we start to imagine um, or even approach the conversation in the political arena that they must encourage the private industry to come along and partner with us all on this. It's no longer an option to say it doesn't meet uh, our financial projections. How do we get there? Well, I think one way we can get there is by more accountability on the part of, of manufacturers and private companies. So if they actually ha you know, um, had to deal more with the, the aftermath or the consequences of what they're creating um, and they would think more longer term. Um, and this is just in terms of like consumer goods in Europe where they have laws where you, the manufacturer has to find a way to dispose of old computers or yes, you know, equipment. Yes. And, and that really changes the way they're going to manufacture them if yes. they have to be responsible for them. Yeah. So that's one way is mm -hmm. things like that. I, I think, and I think one other thing which I wanted to say is that if we, you know, in the city, in New York City, a long time ago now, we instituted something called the fair share criteria, which was supposed to evenly distribute unwanted facilities across the city so that everyone had to have them in their neighborhood. You know, it would, they would be, again, more evenly distributed and not clustered right. in some right. areas. If everyone had to share in these things, we would, you know, we would think more about what we, what happens when we flush our toilets, if we all had to 
have some kind of sewage the consequences. treatment facility or something. Yes. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, we are just about out of time and this has been extraordinary. Peggy, I'm gonna offer you the last words. I think we have about one minute. Um, so if you'd like to close us out and maybe even recruit uh, for young and, and energetic members, the floor is all yours. Absolutely, you know, we would love to work more with City College. We have over the years um, under, you know, different professors who've come and gone. Um, so we'd love to do that. We um, certainly take interns. We have monthly uh, membership meetings on the second Saturday of every month from 10 to 12, where we get about 100 or more people. Um, so the myth that low-income folks don't care about the environment is a myth. It is not true. Um, and I you know, welcome everyone to join us. Go to our website, uh, see the events that are coming up and uh, find more information there. Um, and you know, if people want to give me a, an email, I'd be happy to answer some other questions. Fantastic. Yeah, thank great. you so much. It's great meeting you, um, Professor Rickenbacher. No, absolutely. Yeah. And thank Matt you. Riley as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Peggy. And I'm going to turn it back over to Matthew. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for joining us this afternoon. It was such a lively and important and timely conversation. And I know so many of us heard so many things that resonate in terms of our experiences on our campus. So just to reiterate what, um, what Peggy was just mentioning, if you'd like to learn more, please visit the WE Act website. I know Debbie Chang in the Colin Powell School Office is working to facilitate more internship opportunities for our students. But I think this is also an opportunity to recognize the work that's being done throughout CUNY more broadly. As Sean mentioned in the introduction for Professor Checker, uh, Professor Checker works at CUNY Queens, but is also affiliated with the Graduate Center. So there's opportunities beyond City College where you can learn more about these initiatives and get active not just in the classroom, but in our community. So please take advantage of all the resources that were being shared today. And thank you so much uh, for the lively chat that was going on throughout our conversation. This should be posted within the next week or so, and I'm looking forward to seeing how many of our, how our students get involved uh, in, this, uh, in this ongoing struggle and battle as we move forward. So thank you again to our presenters for today. It was truly an honor and privilege to host you here at City College, and hopefully in the future we can do this in person on campus so we can have a more lively interaction in the, uh, the Colin Powell School Office Conference Room. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye.